This week's element is element 22, engaging students in cognitively complex tasks. The desired effect of element 22 is that students are engaged in cognitively complex tasks that require them to generate and test hypotheses. In this video, you will hear three teachers discuss how they have engaged students in cognitively complex tasks involving hypothesis generation and testing. Embedded in their conversations, you will hear them talk about strategies on how they organize their students for the task. The primary focus of this video will be Element 22 with supplementary attention to Element 21, Organizing Students for Cognitively Complex Tasks. True understanding requires students to move beyond initial acquisition and integration of new knowledge toward growing levels of refinement and use. Through this progression, students move from being consumers of knowledge to users of knowledge. For your reference, here are some considerations and planning for design question four tasks. Take a moment to review. There are a variety of methods to create cognitively complex tasks. Four ways are highlighted here. Decision making, use deepened knowledge to develop criteria, brainstorm solutions, evaluate and make decisions. Problem solving, use deepened knowledge in a different context to solve a problem. Experimental inquiry, use deepened knowledge to form a hypothesis, test it and draw conclusions and investigations use deep in knowledge to attempt to solve a mystery or unanswered question. In the following video, you will hear three teachers discuss how they engage students in cognitively complex tasks using some of these strategies and others. I'm Sharon Euler and this is Ridgewood High School. I teach anatomy and physiology, honors and regular classes. Today we're doing a blood pressure lab. I have several Health Academy students so throughout the day they're going to be helping me with the blood pressure because they're familiar with it. Unit. We've just gone over all the aspects of blood. They just had a test yesterday over the components of blood, blood typing, and then this is an entry, our entry to uh, the heart and what's going to happen with circulation now. And so they need uh, complex activities and over the years I have discovered enough information just through experience that I know what it takes to keep them involved. It has to be something that they, they've heard of, they know a little bit about it, that they're willing to investigate and find out more about. So the more complex it is, the more you have to set up a little bit of background. Not a lot, just a little bit of background information so that we can lead them into the lab. Excellent. class. We set this up in all of my classes, all my science classes. I set up their lab groups, pairs, trios, depending on the lab. There are various different ways that it's going to work better. I'm Teddy. And I'm Ethan, and we're in anatomy and physiology honors. And I learned a lot of this And um, we we're now working on the blood pressure lab to find out our blood pressures and to see the effects of it after and before. Uh, before like uh, physical activities, like we have to jog around the uh, building a little bit or just speed walk, and then we calculate it after we do it. Uh, it's pretty much summing up like half a chapter right now, um, just us doing the lab itself, because we have to write down the terms and experience them ourselves. My opinion can be different from his, and like his definition of something can be different, and if we hear both sides, like we can collaborate on both, like 
like if blood pressure, like uh, all blood pressure is the, uh, the definition right here is sometimes referred to as, and then he has a different definition for it, like we can probably combine them and make a better definition for it. Or like, we could, yeah, we could just like help each other out, like if something seems wrong, like we have the iPods for checking our blood pressure. So like we could see like if that doesn't seem right, we can tell each other. My name's Frida Abercrombie. I teach language arts to seventh and eighth grade um, gifted students this year. I have well, when we're first learning how to do some of those more complicated things, they are working usually shoulder shoulder partners, occasionally in groups. I'll give them, um, say, a student's example work from last year. Have them use the rubric. Have them grade the project so that they're looking for the mistakes, looking for those kinds of of ins and outs. So we might do a cooperative group where they have to then report out on their findings. It could be shoulder to shoulder partners where they're um, explaining to each other where they made their mistakes and what they're going to do next time, the sharing, and then a lot of individual reflection in their learning journals. And then another big assignment that we do twice a year is their independent study project. They choose the topic, um, they choose the tasks from task sheets, it has to add up to X number of points. They have approximately six weeks to do all the research. They have rubrics for the different tasks. They might create PowerPoints, web pages, a whole menu of, of things that they can choose from to create. They also have to present their findings in a four to six minute oral presentation. So all of My name is Joe Holtry and I'm a third grade teacher at Denham Oaks Elementary School. Uh, earlier in the year we did a design question for um, learning experience at the end of an activity and it was designed to have kids generate their hypotheses and how we did that is they came up with the, the best way to create a raft based on I just laid out some materials for them and I said I need this raft to hold a certain amount of weight and they just set about it talking about how what they think the best way to design one would be. Then once they had all put them together, uh, we went over and tested it and they saw which rafts were really successful holding a lot of weight and which ones fell apart pretty quickly and then they went back and said, okay, at the end of it, what would I do differently next time? How would I change it to make my raft better? And I think one of the coolest parts of the whole um, design question for experience for me was then a lot of kids took those raft projects home and they started building these crazy rafts and doing videos of it and they they sent them in to me and you know it, it really took the learning from here outside of the classroom and you know I, I just love the entire follow-up to the experience. I built a raft with a group of people and we tried it out we saw how many beans it would hold um, there were four groups, uh, they, we were tied with another group for first place and we tried it out again and ours held the most. Last quarter I built two rafts and at my house I compared which raft would be, uh, would hold more wa bags of water and I thought that the, the second one would hold the most water and I tried it out. The first one only held, I think, three bags of water. And the other one hold, held five bags of water. So my hypothesis was correct. Okay. Uh, today's, today's design question for opportunity that I gave them was actually more of a previewing. Um, I basically taught them the term conductor uh, and then I showed a, tried to show a little video, didn't go so well because of technology issues, but eventually the, I had them set a hypothesis for what type of material they think would be the best conductor at the beginning, and I gave them rubber, uh, wood, and metal as their choices. A lot of kids said wood, a lot of kids said metal, and then we went through an experiment. Well, today we learned about conduction and we had to make a hypothesis about what would be a good, what would be like the best for conduction. 
a eraser, a hole puncher, and or a pencil. And my hypothesis was it'd be a hole puncher because metal <clears throat> because the metal will get hotter, so it'll make it hot, <clears throat> and it'll, so it'll be the best conductor. And then we did something. It was a little project with like pans. Tell us it's about like, the project with pans. We had to draw a pan, and and then like tell what was in it and why we did it. And we did. <laughs> a metal bottom. We did a metal bottom with a wooden handle. <clears throat> the metal was so it could heat up and cook the food, and then the wooden handle so it wouldn't burn your hand. Perfect. We watched a video where they saw some experiments in play, um, and they came to realize that metal is actually the best conductor. So then, as a follow up to that, I had them create a pan based on the learning of what would be a good conductor, that would be your base of your pan, and then what would be a not, not quite as good conductor that would be, work better as your handle. And so they went through and started designing and, and diagramming um, their own version of a pan based on the, the learning that they did today.